Hey, and welcome back to The Deep Dive. This is the show where we take that pile of sources you've got and uh, try to turn them into clear, fascinating insights. Today, we're digging into a topic that's, well, often misunderstood, but really vital to a huge industry, stallion sexual behavior problems. Now, you might think, okay, this is just about whether a horse can breed or not, right? But as we're about to unpack, it's so much more complex. It touches on, you know, their physiology, their psychology, even how they're handled, how they're housed. Our mission today is basically to give you a shortcut to understanding these really intricate issues. We want to reveal the surprising factors that can cause problems, how they figure out what's wrong, and uh, what it actually takes to manage them effectively. Indeed. And this deep dive, it's built on insights from some comprehensive veterinary consults and a detailed review. Both sources really highlight that these aren't just, you know, minor inconveniences. They're a significant challenge in equine breeding and in welfare, too. They often lead to pretty substantial economic losses for stud farms and, frankly, can pose serious safety risks for the handlers and the mares. Okay, sounds important. Let's get ready to dive in. So when we use that term, stallion sexual behavior problems, mm. what exactly are we defining here? It sounds like it goes way beyond just like a lack of interest. It's uh, What's fascinating here is how broad the definition really is. Yes, it includes things like slow or um, variably inadequate precopulatory behaviors or issues with sexual arousal, getting an erection or the copulatory behavior itself. But, and this is interesting, it also covers very specific preferences or aversions a stallion might have. Aversions? Right. Like they don't like certain mares or yeah, handlers. Exactly. Or certain breeding locations, specific procedures, even uh, pieces of equipment used in the process. They can develop really strong feelings about those things. Well, preferences and aversions. Okay. <laughs> what else falls under this, this umbrella? Well, you can also see chronic or maybe intermittent aberrant behaviors. Things like um, excessive biting or licking. Even savaging the mare or handler, which is obviously very dangerous, or just, you know, dismounting too early during copulation. And if we connect this to the bigger picture of these problems, they can impact way more than just breeding success. Unresolved issues can sometimes lead to other behavior problems like uh, general aggression or stereotypers, you know, like cripping or weaving. Mm. And they directly affect reproduction, causing subfertility or sometimes complete infertility. So what does this all mean for the horses and their handlers? I mean, who typically experiences these issues? Is it just young horses or? That raises a really important question because no, it's not limited to one type of stallion at all. We see these problems in novice and experienced breeders, any age, any breed, any performance type. It's uh, it's really a challenge across the board. Okay. Here's where it gets really interesting for me. Mm. Why? Why do these problems happen in the first place? It sounds like it's rarely just one simple thing. Exactly right. The underlying causes are almost always multifactorial. It's a mix. They can range from, you know, simple inexperience to much more complex factors. Things like genetic predisposition, maybe inadequate social maturation when they were young, or maybe suboptimal breeding stimuli. The setup just isn't right for them. Or even an aversive experience, something bad that happened connected to sexual behavior, breeding, or even just general handling. Can you give us some specific examples, like what might actually cause a stallion to develop these issues? Absolutely. Um, common causes include pain associated with breeding. Maybe mm. they have issues in their legs, feet, back, could be the penis or testicles too. Any pain during the act can cause problems. Also, punishment associated with sexual behavior, that's a big one. Punishment? Yeah, like using those so-called anti-masturbatory devices or just rough, inconsistent handling during breeding, especially if normal sexual behavior isn't tolerated by the handlers. Anti-masturbatory devices, that sounds, well, concerning. Yeah. Why is that specific detail so important? This highlights a really crucial point. Masturbation, you know, spontaneous erection, penile movements, it's actually a normal physiological behavior in equids. It happens roughly every 90 minutes or so, and it rarely actually ends in ejaculation. So attempts to inhibit it through whatever means, they're typically counterproductive. It can paradoxically lead to abnormal behaviors or even impotence. You're messing with a normal process. That's fascinating. So human intervention meant to correct a behavior can actually cause deeper problems. Wow. What about the environment itself, the place where they breed? Oh, yeah. Suboptimal breeding environments definitely play a role. Things like poor footing, maybe low ceilings, too much noise, distraction. So simple things, too. Even simple things like breeding accidents. Maybe the stallion slipped while mounting or got kicked by the mare. That can create a lasting aversion. Also, overuse as a breeding stallion, just being overworked mm -hmm. or being overworked in performance competitions. And, of course, abuse is a factor, too. So if we connect this to the bigger picture, 
Is it more about nature or nurture when it comes to these behavioral issues? Like, are they born this way or is it learned? That nature versus nurture dynamic, it's complex, definitely. But the evidence we have strongly suggests that while, yes, there might be genetic predispositions for certain temperaments or maybe disorders like torquedism, it's mm. often mismanagement and negative experiences and those suboptimal environmental conditions that are the significant exacerbating factors or sometimes even the primary causes. So this means behavioral problems are often learned responses to their environment rather than some kind of inherent flaw. Right. So that puts a lot of responsibility back onto the handlers and breeders, doesn't it? To make sure management is right, right from the start. And what about pain? You, you mentioned it earlier. How significant is its role, really? Because it sounds like it might get overlooked. This raises such an important question because the role of pain is significant, yet often overlooked. It absolutely cannot be overstated. While psychological factors, you know, anxiety or bad experiences are often the first thought, Physical pain can be a direct underlying cause. It can cause aggressive behavior, maybe pain in the genital tract, pelvis, or back during greeting, or it can cause specific problems with erection or ejaculation. There can be subtle signs too, like um, if the penis folds back within the prepuce when they get an erection, that can be a behavioral sign of discomfort. A thorough veterinary exam specifically looking for pain really should be a primary diagnostic step, always. Okay, so to really get what's going wrong, maybe we first need to understand how it's supposed to work. What does normal stallion sexual behavior actually look like, step by step? Right. Normal sexual behavior, it follows a pretty characteristic and predictable sequence. It starts with what we call precopulatory behaviors. That's things like nose-to-nose -nose contact with the mare, soft nickering sounds, or Ronazil investigations, smelling the mare's urine, some gentle nipping, and the Fleeman response. That's where they curl their upper lip up. Okay, I've seen that. Yeah. So those behaviors, they transition into the populatory behaviors that involves mounting, penile insertion, vigorous thrusting, and then ejaculation. And ejaculation often comes with that distinctive tail flagging. You see the tail pump up and down. Right. Then after successful copulation, you have post-copulatory behaviors. They might stay near the mare, maybe investigate any spilled fluid. Sometimes they'll roll or dust themselves on the ground. That's a fascinating sequence, very specific. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about reproduction itself, specifically sperm production, I hear there's a surprising timeline involved, something breeders need to know. Yes, what's fascinating here and really critical is the duration of spermatogenesis. That's the whole process of sperm production. It takes approximately 57 days almost two months, for stallions to produce mature spermatozoa. 57 days. Yeah. Wow. And this is critical because any injuries, infections, or uh, physiological insults affecting the testes, think like a high fever, maybe really high ambient heat, or even just intense exercise. Their negative effects won't show up immediately in the semen quality. Instead, the detrimental effects only manifest weeks or even, you know, up to two months later in the ejaculate. So what does this all mean for actually managing a breeding program day to day? That delay seems huge. Well, if we connect this to the bigger picture, it just emphasizes how critically important proactive and preventive management is. You have to think ahead. Simple things like providing adequate shade in hot weather, making sure they're properly hydrated, maybe adjusting their workload during really hot periods, and removing things like suspensories right after exercise. These are fundamental things to maintain long-term fertility and prevent that delayed onset of problems. Stud farm managers really have to anticipate and mitigate potential risks well before the actual breeding season starts. Okay, that makes sense. So if a stallion is showing problems, how do we begin to figure out the root cause? What's the diagnostic approach look like? A comprehensive and uh, systematic diagnostic approach is really essential. You can't just jump to conclusions. It always starts with a detailed history, covering everything from the stallion's current health, past health, his general attitude, temperament, also his early socialization experience, what he's fed, any medications, and crucially, step-by-step -step details of his behavior in a sexual situation. What exactly happens? A physical examination is often normal, surprisingly, but sometimes it might reveal subtle evidence of past discomfort or current underlying issues. Right. Beyond the basic health checks, how do you actually assess the breeding behavior itself? 
This raises an important question because behavioral assessment and direct observation are absolutely key. We evaluate libido, you know, his interest, by exposing him to an estrus mare, a mare in heat. We look for signs like restlessness, pawing, vocalizing, doing that Fleeman response. Uh. Then we assess his actual breeding ability. We watch the mounting, the thrusts. Normally you see about three to five strong thrusts right before ejaculation. And that tail flagging we mentioned, that helps identify each of the typically five to seven ejaculatory jets or pulses. So watching closely tells you a lot. A huge amount. And video surveillance can be incredibly useful here too, even just for observing normal spontaneous erections back in the skull, which should happen about every 90 minutes, remember? Huh. So a lot of detective work just from observing. What about the actual like biological analysis? Semen testing. Oh yeah, semen analysis is a cornerstone, absolutely. We look at the gross appearance, the volume, the concentration, and crucially, we assess motility, both total motility and progressive motility. We're aiming for at least 60% progressively motile sperm, meaning they're moving forward properly. Morphology is also critical. That's the percentage of normally shaped sperm. Look. Semen analysis can help diagnose specific conditions. Things like azoospermia, that's no sperm at all, hmm. or oligospermia, low concentration, often defined as less than maybe 15, 16 million per ml. Then there's asthenozoospermia, which is reduced motility. Teratozoospermia, abnormally shaped sperm, often less than 4% normal morphology. Hmm. Or necrospermia, which just means dead sperm. Wow, lots of specific terms there. And hormones. It feels like that would be a primary go-to for something like libido problems. Is it that simple? You'd think so, but what's fascinating here is the nuance of interpreting hormones. The relationship between circulating testosterone levels and actual libido, it's not straightforward. While, yes, low levels of LH and FSH, those are other hormones, can indicate what we call organic impotence, even if testosterone looks normal. A simple baseline testosterone test is often just not enough information. So just checking testosterone doesn't tell the whole story? Often not. We frequently need provocative tests, like the HCG response test. That helps us truly assess how well the testicles are functioning, their capacity to produce testosterone when stimulated. This implies that simply, you know, giving testosterone to boost levels might not resolve libido issues if the underlying cause is actually psychogenic, meaning psychological, or related to other dysfunctions within that whole HPT axis, the control system. Yep. And we also use more advanced tools sometimes, things like ultrasonography to look at the testes, maybe even a testicular biopsy or molecular cytogenetic screening to find really subtle physiological abnormalities. So it's a deep dive diagnostically too. Once we, or rather the vets, have a diagnosis, what do we do? How do we actually treat these complex issues? Right, management. Effective management is definitely multifaceted. It usually integrates behavioral modification, sometimes pharmacological interventions, medications, and critically, addressing any underlying physiological conditions that were found. Behavioral strategies are often the most effective primary approach, especially for libido issues. Things like continuous but appropriate access to mares combined with really skillful and patient handling, that's considered very effective for inadequate libido. But the handlers need to be competent, experienced, and have a sympathetic demeanor. And ensuring a safe breeding environment is paramount. Okay, let's unpack that a bit. What are some specific behavioral techniques you might use? Well, for troublesome behaviors like, say, nipping or kicking during handling, Often, a non-reactive response from the handler can help extinguish them over time. For nipping, you might minimize accessibility or maybe use soft grazing muzzles temporarily. For kicking, say, during penis cleaning, handlers need to position themselves safely and just calmly ignore the kicking, making sure the whole process is comfortable and not stressful. Environmental management is also key. Things like continuous mare exposure can help. Housing timid or reluctant breeders near mares might boost confidence regular outdoor exercise, good ventilation, these all positively impact libido and general well-being. Makes sense. And what role do medications play in all this? A pharmacological agents, MEBs, they're valuable adjuncts. They support the other strategies. Hmm. Hormonal therapies like GnRH analogs or sometimes even testosterone can boost libido. But you have to be careful. Increasing male hormone levels can also potentially increase aggressive behavior, which you don't want. Right, a potential downside. Exactly. Anxiolytics, uh, like diazepam, can sometimes be used carefully as a training aid for stallions that are very anxious or maybe just novice breeders, helping them relax. And crucially, analgesics pain relief. 
used to manage any physical discomfort because, as we said, pain is so often an underlying cause or contributing factor. We might use NSAIDs or maybe gabapentin if we suspect neurogenic pain. Even alpha-2 agonists like xylazine, which, interestingly, can sometimes facilitate ejaculation rather than inhibit it despite being sedatives. So it really sounds like it all comes back to that holistic approach we talked about earlier, looking at everything together. Absolutely, 100%. Ultimately, getting successful outcomes hinges on diligently addressing any underlying physiological conditions, whether that's testicular degeneration, managing heat stress, fixing nutritional deficiencies, treating infections, or dealing with musculoskeletal limitations. For instance, just mitigating heat stress, properly adequate shade, Good hydration adjusting workload can make a huge difference. Every piece of the puzzle has to be considered. Wow. This deep dive has really shown us that stallion sexual behavior problems are, yeah, anything but simple. From that really complex definition that goes way beyond just, you know, can they breed or not, to these multifactorial causes that weave together genetics, environment, handling painful experiences. Yeah. It's a profound challenge. And we've learned that the actual definition of impotence in stallions, it extends far beyond just a simple inability to get an erection. It really encompasses any disruption in that entire mating sequence we talked about. Issues with libido, mounting, thrusting, ejaculation, even if the physical erection is present. That broader understanding is so crucial for accurate assessment. Yeah, and it's also fascinating to consider that paradox, isn't it? That a stallion can be physiologically perfectly sound, everything working on paper, yet still experience significant behavioral dysfunction just because of learned aversions, anxiety, or maybe improper handling in the past. Yeah. Makes you think. And let's not forget the often overlooked role of pain. It can be a direct underlying cause for so many of these issues, and sometimes it manifests in really subtle ways that are easy to miss. Plus, that delayed and cumulative nature of many physiological insults like fever or heat stress we mentioned means their impact on performance might not be obvious right away. It really necessitates proactive, consistent monitoring. So if we connect this to the bigger picture, stepping back, it's just a powerful reminder, isn't it, that truly understanding any complex biological system or behavioral system, for that matter, requires looking at all the interacting pieces, mm -hmm. the physical, the mental, the environmental. Which, you know, this raises an important question for you, the listener, to maybe mull over. Yeah. Given this really complex interplay of factors and especially that delayed manifestation of problems we see in stallion reproduction, how might applying this kind of holistic, proactive, deeply observational approach... How might that apply to other animal management challenges? Or maybe even aspects of human health? Could it help prevent issues long before they become really apparent? That's definitely a deep thought to ponder. Thank you for joining us for this deep dive into stallion sexual behavior problems. We hope you feel a little more well-informed and maybe gain some surprising insights along the way. Until next time.